What's up guys, Mike Lewis here and welcome to the Mike Lewis Podcast. If you guys want to keep up with me on social media, you can follow me on Instagram at Mike Lewis Official and you can follow me on Twitter at Mike Lou 52 It's where most of my updates come. If you're enjoying my content, give me a like and a subscribe. And without further ado, let's just dive right into this episode. All right, Marie, thanks for coming on today. How are we doing? Thanks for having me. I'm doing well. How are you doing? I'm hanging in there. This is a long time coming, this link. I was, you just stole the words right out of my mouth. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it seems like uh, all your fans are now my fans, and then, like, uh, Those you know. are great fans to have, so. Well, you got a lot of them, you know, <laughs> believe it or not. That's why I always, like... I feel it, it's crazy to me because like that's why I feel like I avoided this like the first time that we had set this up because I'm like who the fuck wants to hear from me you know but I, I mean I guess I'm flattered <laughs> yeah from, from just speaking to someone like you right now like you know you're just like you know you live like a normal life you know what I mean like you know Jersey New York area says like a normal human being yeah but never like are you ever like alone sometimes and it feels weird just knowing that like a bunch of people are like constantly like monitoring like what you're doing on your day to day yeah I mean like it's I get and like especially as someone who's like super insecure like I'm like the queen of post and delete like I post a picture and then I'll stare at it you know and like one mean comment and I'll take it down so yeah it, it's pretty wild I like honestly the fans and the following that I've had have allowed me to be like super successful in real life because believe it or not social media goes a long way these days um but yeah, I'm, I mean, I'm grateful for everyone and whoever's listening out there that loves me. I love you back, so. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you're all over the place now. I mean, I'm sure if you saw my Anthony video, we joked about Netflix and his Are You The One season. Final Reckoning just finally got put on Hulu for the first time. Did it really? Yeah, like in February, but yeah, it's on there. Uh, my my claim to fame, my final reckoning. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know though. If, I, if I'm making a hot take right now, I think that Vendetta is, is you know criminally slept on when it comes to the trilogy seasons. That's just my take. But was, was that the one with the uh, Redemption House? That was Dirty Thirty. Oh, oh, Vendetta's oh. The oh. middle one. Middle one. I've, I mean, these things blur together, but. Honestly, like, I, I, I enjoyed it. I think that, like, that era of Challengers was just so, like, fun. It was, like, before everything got really crazy and, like, kind of locked down where people can still kind of be themselves. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. I mean, I wouldn't want to call, because there was, like, UK people and, like, Big Brother people that just got brought in, but, it, like, in a way, it's, like, the last, like, OG type of run, you know what I mean? Like, now it's, like, completely evolved into like this just big jumble of you know shows and whatnot but i think like that was like the last uh you know nostalgic type of era of you know seasons my sure. opinion yeah i agree with that do you watch when you're not on that was a big focal point people want to know i mean i don't watch tv that much in general um but when i do watch like yeah i'll catch up with things when i can for sure right so you would happen to know that amanda's returning then I do know Amanda is returning. I do know everyone's super excited about that. I think I think it's awesome, honestly. I think that like there's always this stigma against women coming back when they're mothers and stuff like that. And to have like these powerful girls that are, like aren't afraid to speak their minds and kind of like cause chaos. It's just it's a good thing in general for you know this the challenge. Yeah, oh, and I'm glad you kind of brought that up too because. I found it kind of weird how, like, every time a dad returns or is he competing for his kid, everyone's like, oh, this is so, like, cool. And then uh, and then a mom shows up and everyone's like, why isn't she home with her kids? Like, why is she taking off, like, so long? It's like, is, Isn't that the way of the world, Mike, huh? <laughs> <laughs> you think everybody would think like us, huh? Yeah, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> I want to ask, though, you know, just bouncing off to the real world a little bit, what – why would they send you to a location like St. Thomas? Because I went and rewatched that season. I mean, actually, to be completely honest, I've spoken with most people from your season, um, and they all had like pretty much the same, you know, response when it comes to that. Is like that location pretty much? Uh, you guys were what? You were stuck on an island pretty much. You had to uh, pay the boat to navigate everywhere. Was yeah, yeah. 
It, it was it was pretty crazy, and I don't. I mean, I think that they learned their lesson from that. Not that the real world lasted that long afterwards, but I, I was kind of grateful because I was like, thank God I wasn't like in a Vegas type of city because where I was at that age, trying to drink and stuff, it kind of like tamed me in a sense. Like versus if I was like out getting bottles somewhere, but it, it was definitely an odd season. I remember when like I first when they first told us where we were going, I was like St. Thomas, like. Really? St. Thomas? <laughs> so, whatever. I don't know, though. Had you been on the spot and they're like, where do you want to go? I feel like you would have said Vegas. 100%. 100%. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was divine intervention happening. <laughs> <laughs> was like, uh, how many times did you guys go out, though, like to like you know clubs and stuff? Was it that often? Because it didn't seem like a ton of times. I mean, most of my cast didn't like to party, which I was like, where the hell am I? You know, like if I go on vacation, I'm drinking cocktails at like 9 a.m. Like that's who I am as a person. (laughs) You know, that's what I expected the real world to be. But the other thing was, is that um, we had an earlier curfew than other seasons. So like we would go out and we'd have to come back to the house around maybe midnight because I mean, I know that this is the case for other seasons as well, but theirs is typically a little bit later when, like, the crowd starts getting, like, kind of really drunk and, like, you know, the the lights are on and everyone's kind of, like, trying to jump in and cause a scene. So we had it going early. The boat thing was horrendous. You know, like, rain or shine, that's how you have to take to, like, get off the island. So it was definitely an experience. That's interesting because, actually... The, the, the New Orleans season, which I believe was maybe two seasons before you guys, something around those lines. Yeah. They, um, two or three seasons. Um, they actually had the same curfew as you guys, which is kind of nuts. I, I kept saying to them, it was like really unrealistic to imagine a bunch of uh, late teen, early 20 year old kids coming yeah. home at 12 a.m. in New Orleans. Things don't get popping off there until like two. Yeah. And then like if, you know, if you had one of our, one of my castmates like going to church or doing something that's like civil and domestic, <laughs> like none of us, none, like the rest of us couldn't leave the house because the boat was gone. Yeah. So, yeah. Do you think that having you guys kind of like sheltered in, in an environment like that is what led to like most of the, the dissension between you guys? Cause it seemed like, um, I mean, they're kind of clicked up now. Do you feel like you're on the outskirts with, like, your Kathleen? <laughs> For sure. <laughs> I've always been on the outskirts with them, man. Um, it's really interesting because a lot of the drama that happened on the show didn't even get aired. Yeah. So, um, th- I mean, the environment definitely played a part in it because we're kind of just, like, trapped there the whole time. There wasn't really much to do. There's only, like, two or three spots that we can, like, regularly go to. Other than that, nothing much. But, um... Yeah, I don't know. I feel like I'm, you know, I'm still close with Toya. That's my girl for life. I'll always be her friend. Rob's married, so I don't really talk to him. Um, but, you know, when the group chat goes off, I'm always answering. And, I mean, I have love for all of them now, but it was definitely, I was definitely, like, an outcast there, so. Yeah, I had Latoya on a while back. That was a... She, she, <laughs> He's wild. <laughs> to talk to. Yeah, it was funny that um, I, <laughs> Rob's been on here, too. I asked him if Marie got invited to the wedding. <laughs> nope, didn't get invited. <laughs> I mean, I'd say that's, that his is a little reasonable, you know what I'm saying? Like, that's kind of like, you know, something that's reasonable. But something like, um, I mean, I don't know what your dynamic is with, like, you know, Trey and Swift and those people, but... Yeah, no, we're, we're all good now, but um, definitely during filming and after it, um, <laughs> I was definitely an outcast, so. Was there any moments that you just mentioned about, like, you know, obviously on air that, like, stick out in your mind right now that you could recall, or is it memory a little foggy? Um, so there was one day that Swift's friends were there, and we were taking a boat ride home, and I was <laughs> three sheets to win, like, black on drunk, and apparently I tried to, like, push him off the boat. Not, like, really push him, but, like, fuck with him, kind of push him, you know? And he, when I tell you, like, he was talking to producers and all this stuff, like, how he wanted me to get kicked off. You know, I went up to him that morning, and I asked him, you know, well, I apologized. I was like, I don't really remember it happening, but I should never, like, do something like that, yada, yada, yada. And they actually had a therapist come to the, <laughs> come to the house. Oh, my God. Yeah, and we all sat in a circle, and I swear to God, it was like a Marie roast. Like, everyone was just like, and she does it. And, like, and then, like, the, the producers were like, all right, Marie, well, you know, you're, you either have to stop drinking or 
you have to go home. And I was like, I'll pack my bags right now. I was like, I'll leave. <laughs> what am I going to do if I can't stay here and drink? Like, then I'll really be miserable. Um, so once I kind of like put my foot down with that, they never really went through with it. But <laughs> Wow. Holy shit. Yeah, I was going to bring that up about the boat. That's funny. <laughs> <laughs> It was playful, but honestly, I think Swift is hilarious. He's someone that, like, when you get to know, you have to really appreciate him as a human, and he's a, he's a good guy. He's another North Jersey boy, so. I, the, the majority of my cast was East Coast. I oh, think that 100%. Yeah. Laura was the only one that was kind of, like, not from Brass. our... Yeah. Uh, Everyone else was East Coast. It was, like, Jersey, Philly, uh, Maryland, uh, North Carolina. Like, nobody from the other side, so... I think during like that like little nucleus where you took off shows in your first stint, I'm pretty sure that they wanted you and Trey for Rivals 3. That's what the rumor mill was. I'm pretty sure that they wanted me and Sam. Well, that would have been Rivals 2. Rivals, so Rivals 2? Yeah. Was that right after my season? That was the season right after seasons, yeah. Yeah, so I was, I was supposed to be with... So when I had gotten off uh, my real world... And so when we were filming the re- when we were filming the challenge, our real world was airing. Yeah. So I got home maybe like almost towards the end of our season. I came home to all of like the trolls and all the nastiness. And for me, it was just kind of like, you know, I'm not a reality star. I'm just a star. You know, like I, I don't need the hate. I didn't have a job at that time. So it was like before I kind of like, you know, jump into this reality TV world, I want to have an actual career. Um, it's just who I am as a person. And, you know, I, I like to think that I have a lot more to offer than just being a, a psychopath on reality television. <laughs> um, so yeah. So after ballot seasons, I ignore their calls. Well, they called me every season for about six years. And then of course I f- came back to invasion and, and that was terrible for me. So it wasn't really, uh, the best comeback, you know? Was it you or Rob that declined X's too? Because I definitely think that they tried for that. Uh, I it, it was it was probably me at that point. Yeah. I had said no to them all the way up until Bloodlines, where I said yes, um, and I was supposed to go with my youngest sister, who's an absolute like athlete. Like this girl is just stacked, and you know I, I was still very much like in this business type like world, and I ended up kind of getting cold feet, and I backed out. So they never forgive me for it, but that would have been a fun season to be so, on. So, so the original Bloodlines, you were slated to be on, you backed out? Yeah. Wow, holy shit. Yeah, because the, um, the Stack sisters were telling me that <laughs> that Vendetta's before that was supposed to be a Bloodlines 2, so they were supposed to have a second Bloodlines, and then you both ended up, you know... Well, actually, you remained on the cast, but, you know, your cousin was dropped, and then the Stack sisters obviously got cut. Yeah. Yeah. When the format changed. Yeah, I, I really wish I was on. That just seemed like an overall like fun season to be on. What, a uh, season? Yeah, it did, yeah. honestly. It looked like a lot of fun. I would have started a lot of shit on that season. For, and, like, also, like, I was also worried that, like, I knew how I was coming off these shows and how I took kind of, like, the criticisms and stuff from all these people. And me and my sister are just completely different people. You know, and I, and I wasn't sure that she'd be able to handle that. And I also wasn't sure that, like, if someone ever said something about my little sister in that house, I would have completely lost my mind. <laughs> like, And, yeah. like, I, w- I was just hoping that if and when I did come back to TV, like, I, I came back with, like, so, you know, like a, 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 like a mature air about me. And I, I wasn't sure that that was going to be the season to do it. So It's, like, amplified when it's someone that's actually, like, an important part of your life is the one on yeah. the end of... Yeah. <laughs> and, I'm, and I'm always that person that, like, you could say whatever you want to me, and, like, I'm kind of unaffected, but you say something about my family or my friends, and, like, I'll go harder than, like, I'd ever go for myself. So it was kind of a predicament. Uh, looking back and, like, the situation with my work and stuff, I wish I would have done it because uh, I ended up leaving the company I was at anyway, but what are you going to do, right? So. Yeah, you live and you learn. Yeah. <laughs> Was the appearance scene for you popping after your real world season? Like, how many did you, of those did you get to go on? I don't. I'm not even sure if anybody watched St. Thomas. <laughs> like, I was so pumped. I was like, I'm gonna get paid to go to bars. Like, that was not the case. Uh, it, it's definitely, um, you know, a different situation with reality TV. In fact, I after I got off the show, I deleted all of my social media accounts, uh, my Twitter, my Instagram. So, like, what I have now is what I had before. In fact, if you go on Instagram and you look up Marie MTV, like somebody stole my handle, like (laughs) like they took it away from me. Um, But yeah, I don't know where I was going with that. 
Yeah, you know. <laughs> you know. <laughs> no, um, this is funny because Trey, I don't know if you, you ever heard from him or not, but one of the appearances they had him going on was like super weird and like janky. And I could like relate because I've actually been to the place. It's yeah. like they had him go into an under 21 club, right? So like all the girls there were obviously like, you know, young, all the guys there, everyone's young, you know? And they wanted him to like judge a tour contest with a bunch of like 16 year old girls. It was like the weirdest thing. And then he, <laughs> ended up, he ended up like leaving early or something like that. And like, get into a fight with like the manager of the place i think i got like one one or two of like those types of events and one of them was like upstate new york i brought two of my girlfriends with me and when i tell you literally nobody showed i felt so bad because i like was like well, you know sorry guys but like you're still paying me kind of thing <laughs> like there was nobody there yeah so that'll be a good segue into this next topic then because we talked about obviously like taking breaks with social media and whatnot you know you're obviously not there's no well there's a lack of presence rather of yourself on twitter what is that maybe a stem of like you know obviously you mentioned about fans what they might say and just like negative vibes like what is like the real stem of you uh having maybe a lack of presence on twitter at the moment so huh. i no longer have my twitter if i was to sign in today i wouldn't be able to get my blue check mark back i'd probably have to have a new name um and for me it was just about Listen, like, there's a saying where, you know, don't put anything in writing, you know, and I think that a lot of these potential or future castmates can learn something from that, where, you know, you, you have one mood swing or you feel a certain type of way and you put it in writing, you know, that stuff comes back to haunt you. Twitter is, it's not an asset to me. It doesn't make me money. It only, honestly, it aggravates me. And the more that you, the more that you speak up and you use Twitter, the more that you open yourself up to trolls and that kind of stuff. And again, like, I'm just... I'm a normal human being, like, I, I get very, very insecure, and I also, like, I don't like to, I don't want people to think that I'm not who I am, like, I'm humble, I'm a nice person, and there's been times where, like, I've looked back on my own things that I've said, and I'm just like, who am I? Like, that's, that's corny, you know? So, I deleted my Twitter, I'm not there anymore, I still check in here and there with a little secret uh, Twitter, but outside oh. of that, uh, yeah, I, I like to keep to myself now, I think it's a better look for me. No, I hear what you're saying. I mean, if I was, um, you know, obviously my current situation kind of calls for it, of course, but I totally get where you're coming from. I actually deactivate my time to time. Uh, <laughs> it's good for the soul. Yeah, good for the soul. <laughs> <laughs> do you feel like maybe you, do you lose yourself in a way is what you're trying to say? Like through Twitter, like you don't recognize yourself when you're tweeting? Yeah, and you know, the more that you feed these trolls and like you answer these people, you, you not only lose yourself, you lose your time, you know, you're focused on things that really don't matter. And in the grand scheme of things, like, nobody cares. Like, this is what people have to start getting through their head. Like, nobody cares. They're not thinking about me today or tomorrow or the next day. And people could be really cruel. And it's just like, I, I'm not that person, you know, I, I, I'm not someone that like just needs to bash people. And listen, I, I've done my fair share of bashing. So I apologize to all those who like caught it while it was hot, you know, but like, I, it, it just, it, it doesn't, it's kind of, it stifled me in a way of like growing up. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. I, I, Twitter is, and I told you this before the recording, it's like the hot spot for impulsive. Yeah. Dis- yeah, and then I would look back on my Twitter and I'd be like, why the fuck am I tweeting every two minutes? Like, way to let people know that I'm not doing shit in my life. Like, you know, like, that's when I knew that, like, I was just not in a good place where, like, I'm constantly tweeting and I'm constantly looking at things. Like, if I wanted to grow up and be successful and do the things that I, you know, I'm hoping to do now, it's like, I don't need to be voicing my opinions about things that don't matter. Yeah, for sure. So how different was jumping back into your second stint from your first one like obviously there was still like a lot of people you remembered from shows but um how like different was it maybe for you mentally and both like you know being in that environment well this is something that i wanted to speak about on some sort of public forum for a minute so i'm gonna kind of like move a little bit further um and then come back around here so about almost a year ago um i ended up in the hospital in west palm beach 
And what had happened was, it's a really crazy story, but basically with divine intervention, I ended up in the hospital. And if anyone out there is listening that is like in, you know, the medical field or whatever, I had a level, um, my calcium level was at 18. Um, and after being in the hospital for two weeks during COVID, I found out that I had something called hyperparathyroidism my entire adult life, basically. So what hyperparathyroidism, it's something on your thyroid, it's like a tumor, right? And what it does is it pumps out this calcium into your body at excessive rates. So what, you know, calcium is good for your body unless it's like that. And what it does is it breaks down, it breaks down your bone, it breaks down your organs, it breaks down your mind, you know? And it's, it's funny to me because going back to your question, when I came back to the show, a lot of people kept saying, you know, she's not who she used to be and, you know, all of this other stuff. And to me personally, I, I didn't feel like that either because I was looking at girls who were half my size and I come from like, you know, an athletic family. I'm a bigger girl, quote unquote, you know. So for me to sit there and see these girls who are half my size, you know, beat me in these physical competitions, I was like, what is going on? So, you know, looking back, when we do these shows, we don't get health insurance. So I never, you know, was going for my blood checks and all this other stuff. So I, I was really hoping that if and when the time comes for me to go back, you know, on screen or, you know, have the opportunity to, that I want to bring light to that. There, there's so many things that you don't know what's going on in your body that like you might just assume is like you being crazy. Like the symptoms of hyperparathyroidism is like weak, moody, you know, like bitchy. I thought that was just me being me. You know, but meanwhile, like if I didn't end up in the hospital when I was supposed to, I was the doctors told me that I was about like two weeks away from dying. So, really, yeah, like I, legitimate. I'm not just saying this to like, you know, get cloud or whatever. Hyperparathyroidism is something that um, if diagnosed early enough is very easy to contain. But at that point, I had been living with this for so long without, you know, doing my medical checks and stuff that my kidneys were about to fail. So looking back on the show, I was 100% not the same person because obviously I was unwell. Um, but yeah, there was definitely like a fire missing from me when I came back. I think that people were like expecting to see, especially after my Battle of the Seasons debut. Um, and I just, I, I just didn't have it there. I was also very weary about how, you know, what I would do on the show might reflect my actual outside life. So... Yeah. So you said that was a year ago, you, you said? Yeah. So I have not, I haven't been on any show like in good health since Battle of the Seasons. Wow. So was there like a particular event that took place that had you go to the hospital? All right, fine. Twist my arm, Mike. <laughs> um, so um, this is actually, this is a really crazy story. So the majority of my adult life, you know, when I was in sales and stuff, I was taking Adderall. The pandemic hit. I actually, you know, I was it was during COVID. I was actually quarantining out with Nani, like out in Florida. Wow. And I stopped taking Adderall because I was like, what? It's not like I'm working. You know, what do I have to do? Right. So I stopped taking Adderall and I just became super, super lethargic. Like I couldn't get out of bed. Like I was I was super skinny. Um, and my sister called me up one day and when I tell you, like, we went from having a normal conversation to me, like, absolutely losing my mind and, like, breaking down. So she flew out to Florida to literally pack my bags for me and bring me home. So she brings me back to New York, you know, and now, you know, I'm lucky enough to have a super supportive family where, you know, we're discussing, like, what could possibly be wrong with me? You know, like, what is going on? Um, so we came to the conclusion that it must be withdrawal, right? I must be going through Adderall withdrawal. So... I made a decision that, you know, it was COVID. I can kind of be like off, you know, off the radar that I was going to check myself into rehab. So when I first was looking into rehabs, it was going to cost me about $30,000 for a month for like the full month. And like here I am like sitting there like $30,000. Like my parents were ready to like do whatever they had to do to get me there. But I'm like for an Adderall, like that doesn't, it's not like, you know, the people that are going into these clinics usually have much bigger problems than that. Um, but I ended up finding an insurance plan that my dad had made me get when I lost my job in Florida due to COVID. And I found it like under my seat one day, like while I was going through this process and I called them up and I had literally three days to reinstate this insurance for like $68. And it went from $30,000 to 1500. Wow. So for me, I, I was like, this is a sign, like I gotta go, you know? So, you know, I put my ego aside for once, thank God. 
you know, I was on the next flight to right. West Palm Beach. And I'm, I'm like, it was straight out of a fucking movie. Like, my roommate's name was Hope. I had a little, like, rehab boyfriend, right? So I'm there for about 22 hours, and the nurse had taken my blood. And they called me into the nurse's office, and they were just like, hey, like, we need to send you to the hospital. And I was like, you know, why? Like, I felt, I still at that point was very much, like, losing my mind, but still, like, you're not really sure what's going on there. Um, And that's, that's kind of how everything transpired, so... Like, uh, you know, I think it's really important for people to know that, like, I didn't know that I had hyperparathyroidism, you know, like, I didn't realize that it was something that was like inside of me and stuff like that. But I still made the decision to seek help. And I think that's super important for people to hear, like, it's okay to not be okay. Like, there's so many different things that are going on in your body that you might not be aware of. And there's such a stigma against this mental health thing. Like, it's funny, because I feel like I got to get out of jail free card, you know, like, where... In, in any other situation, my parents would have been, you know, probably a little bit, you know, this is sad to say, but probably a little embarrassed that they had to tell their friends and family that, like, I went to rehab, you know, yeah. but I actually ended up being sick and it, and it had nothing to do with the Adderall or anything like that. And it's funny, it's because, you know, some of the, one of the symptoms of hyperparathyroidism is lack of attention. So I was like self-diagnosing myself, you know, my entire adulthood. But yeah, I think that's really important message to get out there. Like, I didn't know it. I put my ego away. And like, you never know what's going on in, in your body. So it's kind no, of I, I really appreciate you sharing that story because I think that it's kind of important for someone like you to, you know, come forward and like speak the way you are right now. Because oftentimes we see maybe fans of the show or, you know, they see what they would consider larger than life personalities and think like they're just like, they've got like a coat of armor, you know what I mean? Like yep. negativity doesn't affect them, you know, like internal stuff doesn't affect them. And yeah. I think for someone in like your shoes to come forward the way you are now is like really big and important. I'm glad you, I'm glad you did that. So yeah. good on you. Thank you. Well, yeah, thank God. Cause I was about two weeks away from dying, but um, yeah, you just have, you have to listen to your body, you know, like don't be afraid to, to get help. You know, there's, you never know what's going on. You know, maybe you do have some kind of disease like I did, or maybe you don't. But, like, if you're putting your, like, that, that's always what they said, like, what, you know, when I got there. It's like, you know, the, the, fir- the biggest step is putting yourself out there to, to find out. So there's options out there for people. And, like, don't ever be afraid to, like, think that something might be wrong with you. Like, I, w- I was literally losing my mind, and I couldn't figure out what was going on. And for so long, I thought I was just depressed. Yeah. You know, and, and like the second that I got this, so I had to have emergency surgery. Like they couldn't even transport me to Miami, which I'm sure, you know, is about an hour from West Palm Beach. Yeah. You know, like that's how bad it was that they could not get my calcium down. Like it had to come out that second. And it, it's just like it, it's really wild how life works out. And the second that they took it out of, you know, my throat, I have like this little scar here now, like my entire like my face changed. Like just everything has like changed for me. And I just, I think it's such an important like thing. And, you know, I get kind of weird about like sharing this story because obviously people are, I'm sure people are going to say shit about this too. But, you know, at the end of the day, like I'm here, I'm alive, I'm healthy and I'm just, I'm happy to be able to kind of speak about it and hopefully help somebody else. Yeah. You picked a good place to share it on. Well, I mean. (laughs) You're the man, Mike Lewis. (laughs) (laughs) So now let me ask you, because this is the term edit gets thrown around very loosely. I'll say that, right? Mm -hmm. You know, people, if they're saying something on screen, like whether or not they want to admit it, like they said it. But obviously, chronological order is a very big thing in reality TV. Portrayal is a very big thing. The narratives, you know, obviously big thing. Were there any moments that like stick out to you in your mind where you're just like you saw it? And you just thought to yourself, huh, like that really kind of is not how I remembered it. <laughs> how long do you got, Mike? Uh, <laughs> hey, well, of course. So there's, there's a couple. Um, so one of them was the pizza incident, the really popular pizza incident, right? Yeah. Um, so the, the story behind that is that I took a box of pizza, I put it in my room, and I saved it for my roommates, Okay. Then I, then I came back in, I started eating pizza again, and that's when Brad was getting all crazy, and I was like, this guy's nuts, like, I'm just saving pizza for my friends, you know, the, you're eating, like, a whole pie over there, sir, 
So, you know, I put it aside and then he, he, he like flipped out about it to the point where I was like, all right, you know what, this isn't even worth it. So I actually went back and I returned the pizza right before all the other stuff went down. So like, I was kind of upset how that was portrayed. Um, the next one was I was in an elimination against Tori and we were blindfolded in these like, right. whatever. And granted, she beat me. Don't get me wrong. But I put up a fight so much so that I like gathered my family and friends around. Cause I was like, finally, they're going to show me like, look a little bit like a badass, Like I used to be, you know, and like, I'm watching with my family and like, I'm totally expecting to lose, but like they played it like one, two, three, like done. And like, yeah. for me, that was like unfortunate. And then lastly, I would say, um, I think it was Vendettas, um, right after Tony had won that like mayo eating thing. Is that Vendettas? Yeah. yeah. Um, the, the way it went was that if you won the challenge, the daily challenge, that following challenge, you were in charge of the teams. So it was an underwater challenge. And I came up with the idea because it was a guy's elimination to make these teams in a certain way that basically solidified like who was going to win and who was going to lose. And I put myself on a team with it was like me, Cam, Kaylee, Nelson and Brad. Right. Cam, Kaylee, Nelson can't swim. Right. And if I'm on this team, I'm just going to throw it anyway. And they, then they never showed that. And I feel like, you know, it would have given a little bit more credit to like what I do behind the scenes often that like never kind of gets shown. But like to your point, you they can only play what you give them. Right. And I always said to myself, if I ever went back on TV, I would try to be a little bit less self deprecating because it's just who I am as a person. But when you're feeding that to them all the time, it's very easy for them to make you look like a weak player and like you don't care. So. Right. Um, it kind of seemed like the way they wanted to portray you was sort of like, because, uh, I mean, you did make, you know, self-deprecating jokes, so that played into it. Um, it kind of wanted, like, for me, the vibe seemed like they wanted to make you out to be kind of like the, I'm more focused on partying, you know, competitions, whatever type of yeah. character if that makes sense yeah I mean don't get me wrong I definitely was there to party like <laughs> and you know like I'm also like I'm a realist like I know at the end of the day like am I gonna win a million dollars over a Cara or over any of these people who their lives are literally dedicated to working out no I'm not going to you know oh that's another thing the basket situation yeah the basket situation so I, um, you know, I had come to the conclusion that I'm not going to win this thing, right? There's no way I'm going to win this. And right before that, I had literally just fought with the entire house. Another thing that they didn't show, you know, because I was just calling people out. I'm like, what's your problem with me? Like going around the table. So I knew that like, no matter what happened, my time was coming, you know? So I made the agreement with Kayla that, you know, she had a, a way better chance at getting to the final and potentially winning, you know, and, and if she made anywhere, like cut me off some money or something like that. But like, I threw that challenge too. So, you know, there's a lot of lessons to be learned for myself if I was to ever go back or even the people that are going on. You know, you have to be very conscious of what they can do with your edit and what you're giving them. Um, and, you know, if I ever did get the opportunity to go back, I think that I would make sure to let people know, like, I'm here to play, too. You know, Big T, like, sh I love her. I think she is phenomenal TV. I think she is gold, absolute gold. But at the end of the day, like... You know, she seemed like a better competitor than I ever did just because of the fire and, yeah. you know, her her confidence, which is something that, like, I lacked for, I mean, a multitude of reasons at this point. But, you know, it just goes to show, like, that's it really comes down to what you're giving them. Yeah, that that elimination with Tori is the one that, like, kind of stuck out when it comes to the edit, because I think you could, like, clearly see, like, some patches of hers were, like, removed. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, no, I was, I was really amped about it, because, like, I, when I tell you, like, I thought my ass was going to be, like, I thought I was going to be destroyed on that thing, so, if, like, for me to come out of it and, like, you know, lose by, like, one patch or whatever it was, like, I was, I was, like, I felt good about that, you know? Yeah. But, nah, no, nah, no. Nah. Yeah. So. Let me ask you, though, because she's been under the microscope a little bit, what is, like, your personal dynamic with Tori? Like, because why do you, well, like, well, actually, I could ask you kind of, like, a jumble of questions. What was your personal dynamic with her, and why do you feel like now, all of a sudden, she's uh, maybe garnering some more hate than she did before? Tori, so she's never, you know, she's never been rude to me. She's always been nice to me. I think she's a nice girl. I think that she's very smart, something that I've lacked in 
how she portrays herself and being weary of what's going on. And I think that that will make other competitors and eventually viewers kind of like see through that, you know, like what's really happening kind of shit. Um, yeah. I think that, it, you know, because people are starting to see through that facade or whatever you want to call it. Um, I think I'm excited to see her, what she's going to do on this challenge. Cause I think that, you know, it's kind of like guards are down now, like just be your true self. Um, but I don't, I don't necessarily have anything to say about her other than like the same thing that the fans are saying. Like, you're just like, how can somebody always be on like a hundred percent like that? You know, like she has to have her bad days. So we'll say. Yeah, for sure. So, Going into Final Reckoning, you had to have assumed that, like, Brad was going to be with you, right? Like, partners. Because I figured it would be a shoe, and I'm like, oh, Marie and Brad, 100%. I don't know. I had a a couple of people to choose from, I feel like. (laughs) I just remember, like, I remember when I found out, like, so, you know, in that opening scene where, like, everyone's, like, screaming, like, let me out, like, whatever, like, whatever. I was chilling in that, like, coffin. Like, I gave a new meeting to resting in peace because I was like, Kara's my partner. I'm getting out of here. Like, this is going to be epic. So, like, I was super excited to get Kara. Um, Brad definitely could have been my vendetta as well. But um, things worked out pretty okay, so. What what led you to believe that Kara was, like, going to be your partner? Did, Did you have any clue beforehand? Like, how did that? I... I really didn't. It just came... I thought it was either going to be, like, me or Kayla, you know? So, I just... It's funny, though, because, like, if you actually watch Vendettas, um, when I go out versus Kayla, you'll see that Kara was actually more, like, excited to see me leave versus Kayla. Like, I'm I'm very good... I'm very good at getting people, like, under people's skin. So... (laughs) Probably because they can't really fire back at me because I literally don't care, you know. But, like, I'll hit you where it hurts. Um, so I was excited to get Kara. You know, I also knew that like, going into that and having Kara as a partner because I got so much hate from her following. You know, I was like, no matter what I do on this show, like, it's always going to be my fault. So I think that, like, kind of made me weary going into it. Kara didn't talk to me for, like, two weeks when we started filming. Like, legit would not even talk to me. And, uh, yeah, eventually I kind of broke her down with my charisma. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, it was, it, was a, it was a crazy experience. Yeah, I definitely think that, you know, seeing as how it played out, I think, you know, it was a blessing in disguise that we got you and Carr. I definitely think, you know, maybe going into the fact, a lot of people would have assumed that it would have been Kayla and Carr and then you and Brad. You yeah, know, Based For off sure. just, like, the stories and how they played out. But I got to say, you know, seeing as how it played out, I think, like, one of at least my favorite and just a lot of the people that watched favorite dynamics that they yeah. watched old was definitely yours and cars, you know, relationship and how it played out. How did, do you feel like you got to know her more through that experience? Yeah. I mean, for sure. I think that all of us that do these shows, especially when you're, you know, at the top, right. when you're at the top, you have to expect that everyone's going to come for you. Like just bottom line, that's what's going to happen. Um, and you know, car got her, fair share of hate like when she was like you know coming up through these shows whether it was from other cast members or people just kind of like you know shitting on her and like I I think I said this before where it's like when I came into Final Reckoning like I was at the bottom like it was only up from here you know where like she had you know she had this this person and this persona to uphold about like being this strong competitor but I think throughout the season um I kind of when she started warming up to me it, it brought back Akara that I think people were forgetting for a while, you know, that kind of humanized her and like brought her back down to, you know, humble Kara. Yeah. Did you, did you ever joke with her about how you uh, flipped her in the battle of the seasons oil wrestle? <laughs> no, no, but I'll, I'll make sure to do that this week. And I think I'm seeing her. <laughs> really? Mm-hmm. Wow. You, yeah. Cause I thought you it seemed like you two were in a pretty good place right now. Yeah, I'm, I mean, I like to think that I'm in a pretty good place with everybody. I'm someone that gets over things really quickly. It's when, that's why I like the Twitter shit. Like, it, it's when that, the stuff keeps coming back, you and you, back at you and you feel like you kind of have to, like, defend yourself, you know, from all these people. That that's where a lot of things get lost in translation. So, she seems like she's good. I think that she deserves more than anybody else to be on these shows. I think it's kind of fucked up that she's not. Yeah. Um... But I also think that, you know, production and the powers that be also have, like, particular feelings about her and Pauly, you know? And I always say to her, I'm like, you know, I think that you might have to separate yourself 
And like, it, like if one of you were to get on, like you'd have to do that. And I don't think that, you know, she's in that place. And I mean, nor should she be right. Like she gave so much to the show that she deserves to be on it regardless. So, I mean, for God's sake, she's the face of the Paramount plus. Logo. Right. Like, come on. It's, a, it's, it's actually, it's pretty sad, honestly. I, I feel like it, it's weird though. I feel like this always happens with these female winners, right? Like, something's fishy <laughs> yeah. but also like it's it's just again it's like it's america you know like the same way that mothers get shit and all this other stuff like yeah like, we women like when we go on these shows we just we get the brunt of things you know you've never seen like a troll coming at any of the guys talking about their looks or you know all of this other stuff and this is something that people have to deal with every single day and it's fucked up and i think that it's important that like moving forward all of these you know reality personalities or whatever you know, are really mindful about what they say about each other because it it opens up a door that like should not be open. Yeah. And if you're the person doing it, like it's gonna be open. So. Yeah, it, it's it's definitely like it's something that bothers me because you know I mean I think we talked about it or we might have talked about it in the beginning, but um, we see and this is no slight to any dads that compete on the show. Like good for you guys, like kill it. Um, yeah. But. but you know, with someone like, I'll use Teresa as an example. She just came back uh, on the last season, Double Agents. Like, they were calling her, like, Toxic T and stuff like that for literally playing the game. Like, I don't know what I missed, but are we not supposed to make power moves? Like, this is what we came up on. And you're yeah. Doing- so. Yeah, and, and I think that outside of, like, most reality shows, like, the challenge is it, it's not scripted at all. You know, they can take whatever they want and put it wherever they have it. But, you know, compared to these other shows, it's really easy for these people to kind of, like, brush off haters and, like, whatever is happening. Because it's like, all right, well, they told me to say that. You know what I'm saying? Versus a show that, like, this is, like, who you are as a human being. So. Yeah. And I think, like, one of the biggest moments, well, not moments, just, like, instances, was the final of Final Reckoning. Which, obviously, you know, (laughs) a little clip that you posted surfaced a while back. Um one how did you get a hold of that is my question but uh, um so i was doing the uh i was doing the recaps at the time okay so i had like i had like a lot of the stuff that they were sending us um didn't necessarily make, no act no that's not true um that's what they showed us when so right before you go out and you film the reunion they'll, they'll kind of give you like a mashup of what happens until the end so you can speak about it and yeah. that's what they showed but you know what they show us there and also like before the cutting room floor isn't necessarily what actually makes it to the end. You know, they also didn't show that I, like I told you, I was I was ill. You know, I had this disease going on that my bones were breaking really easily. And and right, the elimination with, um, between Johnny and like Natalie and them, um, I went out to use the porta potty and then ended up like falling out of it. I don't know how I did that. But regardless, I sprained my ankle and they didn't show it once. Like my ankle was like the size of a, of a football and not once did they show it when I was running through it they just you know again like kind of jumped on the fact that I'm a quitter and stuff like they like even at the eating part I remember eating shit and like saying in my interviews like everyone says like I don't have any heart but here's fucking six chicken hearts in my fucking mouth like go fuck yourself kind of shit you know and like none of that was shown so yeah wow yeah there was like a lot from that I was like had they shown that clip that you put up there, I'm like, one, it would have provided us with a lot more <laughs> substance as to, like, you know, what was going on. And, um, you know, two, I was like, wow, I didn't know Joss had that much personality. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, but, like, they cut out a lot of, like, when me and Cara got drunk and, like, started fighting with everybody, they cut out so much. Like, I was saying some absurd shit. I was like, oh, there's a lot of lions tigers and cheetahs in here like yelling at paul yeah. like there was so much shit going on and like it, it was just it was wild like the fact that there was wine there the i remember like this tweet that uh the challenge mtv put out where it was like if marie knew there was wine in the final she would have made it like five years ago and like one thousand percent true like would have been there <laughs> <laughs> so, so let me play devil's advocate a little bit here do you th- believe or buy into the theory at all that Joss and Sylvia potentially won that final? I, so, I mean, it had to be, it had to be super, super, super close. Like, it had to be. 
um, we knew that going into it. In fact, like there was parts that they didn't show. Like that's another reason where like me and there was a whole puzzle part where like you think that me and the puzzle queen would have like knocked out of the park, but like we were literally the last people to finish it. In fact, we like we ran out of time, right? So between that and then the eating and all this stuff, we had absolutely no shot of winning, right? But I think that like people kind of got nervous. Well, they we definitely got nervous when you know Paulie and Natalie kind of came back, but. At the same time, we also knew that, like, there was about 15 minutes in the beginning. But, again, it, it is it is TV. So, like, I can't 100% say. But I can say that, like, it was definitely, definitely super close. Mm-hmm, for sure. And you obviously, your last appearance on TV was X on the Beach. I'm curious about your experience in the vibe because, you know, I obviously spoke with Anthony uh, last week. And um, he definitely suggested that the vibe was definitely a lot more superficial maybe than other mtv shows that he's been on would you say that the vibes were a lot more uh different on x on the beach than say like you know your challenge season or real world type season 100 percent. i mean the real world and the challenge i mean it was just you're also there for three months right well i mean the real world is three months and the challenge is many many weeks and there's so many different people there that they have more than enough content right but with x on the beach we only filmed for four weeks so there was a lot of situations where they would be like, all right, can you guys come film this scene kind of thing? Where just really made a, just an awkward situation in general because, you know, I'm not really an actress, you know, whatever. Um, and that's where I think a lot of, like, the grief came between me and Devin because, you know, we'd sit there and, like, he would go off on this, like, one thing. And I'd be like, wait, wait a second, like, time out. Like, I thought we were friends. Like, <laughs> like all this other shit. Um, but... Yeah, it it was definitely, definitely a whole different experience. Yeah, so you don't think you would ever do a dating show again? I mean, I'm I'm turning 33 tomorrow, so no, I hope not. Like, that would be fucking embarrassing. (laughs) Like, I'm not too... I don't know if anyone wants to date a washed-up reality star on reality TV. I think think there's more prime pickings for that at this point, so no. Um, Also, like, this whole X on the beach scenario, like, it makes you feel a certain type of way when, like, you're not getting any love from people, you know? And, like, I was there, I thought the the cast was weak as fuck, you know? And, like, uh, listen, when I'm doing a reality show, I'm doing a reality show because of the bigger picture, right? You want to put on a great fucking reality show. That's why they always cast me, because they know I'm going to stir the pot and I'm going to do shit, because what else is there to do? Like, this isn't a lovey-dovey fucking situation. And that's why I had such a problem with the twins, because, like, I was like, what the fuck are you doing here? You know, like, I can't be the only one carrying the show. And clearly I couldn't, you know, because, like, it wasn't, like, a, a very well-recepted season of the show. But it had, like, I think that had you had, you know, my storylines and with, like, the Devin, but then you had other, you know, cast members that had other, you know, spice going on, it would have been a whole different situation. But it just goes to show how, like, these casting decisions can really make or break a show. Yeah, for sure. A fan wanted to know, what was your thoughts on Aubrey O'Day kind of being fake? <laughs> I was so I, I was so starstruck when I saw Aubrey. And honestly, my time, you know, at the house, I really I came to love her. I thought she was really great. Um, you know, afterwards, I had a I had kind of beef with her because, again, she was like all up on the twins, even though she was saying all this different shit. But, I mean, at the end of the day, like, again, like, I, I, I'm really trying to get to a place in my life where I don't judge people on those actions just because, like, there's just, there's so much bigger shit out there. I, I truly believe that she's a good person. I actually, like, I almost wanted to reach out to her one day after I saw, like, all of the pictures and stuff that came out about her recently because, like, yeah. man, like, people are fucking brutal. And, like, it's just, it's so unfair. So I think she's a good person. Do I care if she's friends with the twins? No. Do I think they're corny? 100%. But, like, what do you, like... Well, who am I to judge, right? So, whatever. Yeah, that's a good way to uh, put that. So, I think the question on a lot of people's minds that are going to be watching this, they're obviously going to be curious, you know, when were you last called? Like, when could we have seen you? I'll start by asking, when was maybe the last time you were called for the main show? Was Final Reckoning it? I'd assume you'd have to at least get a few calls for the main show. Uh, I don't remember exactly. I may have gotten an availability call that following season for War of the Worlds 1. But I know for, like, the last, like, one or two after that, I didn't get any call at all. Which, for me, I was like, am I, like, am I blacklisted? Like, I kind of felt, like, hurt. 
by MTV because I was like, I did so much shit. Like, I just put my, like, my full ass on, like, on fucking blast on this stupid X on the beach thing. Like, I at least deserve a fucking call back. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, um, so no, but I, I was recently called for All Stars, which was sort of weird because I think that, you know, in the grand scheme of thing, I don't necessarily fall into that category. You know, maybe one day, you know, down the line. But I think that there's just a lot of older people um, that people would want to, you know, see back and also consider all stars. Um, but yeah, I mean, I was set to go, and then they, <laughs> well, here I go, I was talking too much again. Um, I got dropped because of my uh, background check. Um, which, by the way, like I, I, I am someone like I was growing up with morals. You know, I come from a good family. I don't, I don't say stupid shit. I don't, I don't hate on people. You know, I'm not a bigot. I'm not like against homosexuals. I never say anything like you know, uh, anything derogatory, like, that's, it's not who I am, it's not who I was brought up to be, so when I found that out, I was like, what the fuck, I'm like, what the hell do they have on me, you know, so when I, I actually, like, I, like, forced them, because when you get these background checks, they have to send them to you if you request them, so I got it sent to me, and, like, I mean, listen, <laughs> about a year ago, it was actually about two weeks to the date that I ended up in the hospital, I basically told MTV to go fuck themselves, yeah, yeah. but at the same time, I was losing my fucking mind, you know, like, if you want to get, like, another chance, like, I feel like that's, a, you know, like, something that, like, can be overcome. Like, I would have happily went on TV and, like, made a joke about it, you know? Like, it, you know, it, they weren't giving me PTSD and depression. It was my fucking hyperthyroidism, <laughs> you know? But then, like, the other stuff was, was really, it was, like, um, I had, like, a backless shirt on, and it said, like, you know, um, the CDC said masks and bras are optional. By the way, this is after the CDC said that, like, masks are optional. So it was like, you know, we, we're living in a different age right now where I can understand where I wouldn't be the most appealing person to bring on when you have a very sensitive um, audience. Mm -hmm. You know, and they also know that, like, listen, I'm, I shouldn't have posted that. I shouldn't even be talking to you about, like, this whole, like, background check thing. But it, it's it's who I am and, like... You know, I, I was super excited to go on there because I felt like I had a story to tell. And I, and I still do because, like, uh, there's something, there's a part of me that after giving so many years to the show and also, like, you know, the mental stuff that you give and, like, a, a part of me has been given to MTV, you know, where, like, I, I feel like I deserve another chance, whether it be with, you know, the challenge or whatever else it might be. No dating shows, you know. But... To go on and, like, prove to people that I'm not this, like, psycho that, like, the last show I was, like, you know, sought to be at, like, there's so many times where I think about, like, X on the beach and how, like, if I was in the, my, you know, the right mindset that I am right now, like, how I would have reacted and handled myself differently, you know, and I, and I believe in my heart that I deserve that opportunity, and who knows if it will come, if it will ever come, because timing means everything, right, like, that's why a lot of people was like, oh, why can't they get like this person and this person? There's so many different things that play into someone accepting their challenge call. You know, so for me with the challenge all stars, I was super excited because it was uh, it's a time in my life where I can do so because, you know, I have a 1099 job where like I basically work for myself. So if I wanted to go and, you know, film a show right now, I could. But yeah. I don't necessarily know what that's going to look like in the future for me. So. Wow. So you were like slated to be on it then, and then. Oh yeah, I was about I was about a week out from. I was getting a facial actually when they called me, and I was like, "What do you mean? I'm, what do you mean?" I was like, "I don't get dropped. Like, what the fuck are you talking about?" You know, like I was so excited. Like, you know, I heard rumors that like Katie Cooley was going and stuff like that, and I was like so excited to meet her. Cause I, I was I was just so pumped. Like, cause I always felt like I was like in the wrong generation of you know challengers. So to go out there and do something like that, like, I, I was super pumped about. Like, I was kind of like a kid in a candy shop, but unfortunately that didn't work out. I don't know when my next show is going to be, if it will ever be again. But I'm happy to, you know, have this conversation with you because that was something that I wanted to get across to people about, like, you know, how I was sick and that, like, you can't you can't ever judge these people. Like, you don't know what they're going I didn't even know I, what I was going through. So yeah. that's why I'm kind of, like, you know, tipping – being very careful about what I say about like any questions that you're asking me because you, you never know what what's going on with people so for sure well uh, I appreciate you taking the time and hopping on here today I had a blast speaking with you I'm glad we were uh, finally finally, yeah, finally able to make this thing happen yeah. we're gonna have to hang out at the Jersey Shore sometime <laughs> uh, yeah let me know I mean you know I was uh, I was down you're only a bridge away 
Yeah, I was an L- I was an LBI this past weekend. Maybe not the best experience, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much for having me. I'm happy that I uh, I got to finally jump on with you. Yeah, no problem. All right, take care. All right, later. See ya.